All right, thank you so much for coming to this workshop. It had a ridiculous name when we listed it, which I think promised you all answers that I could possibly give. We did make an effort to do that and then realized we needed about three hours to actually accomplish that. So we've scoped a little bit. A Hopefully we are going to um, cover this. But one of the things that was um, the sort of inspiration for this workshop is that I've presented here a number of times at GERSIG. And fundamentally, this method is the thing I get the most questions about. The number of people who reach out to me and just email me and are trying to do something and have a lot of questions and don't know what they're doing and are really nervous that they're doing something wrong um, felt unusually high. And as it happens, because I live at Xbox Research most of the time, I've got a lot of experience training other user researchers and how to do this method. And so the goal here is just to sort of take that kind of training, bundle it up, and sort of pass it on as well as I can in this sort of hour. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with narrative usability, um, by the way, sorry, I should introduce ourselves. That's Todd Kelly. I'm Deborah Henderson. I spoke a lot about um, narrative methods when we talked about Quantum Break, but actually everything I did and more Todd has done. He did it on Rise of the Tomb Raider. That was terribly successful as a narrative game. So if you'd like to know who we are, I'm Deborah, not Debbie. Thank you, Randy. And Todd. All right. So. There we are. Um, so the reason we uh, were interested in narrative usability as a method when I first joined Xbox Research is because um, we had a, a good way of testing games, right? We had first gameplay tests very, very early on, and we just tested all the way through. Um, but when we looked at when the first narrative test was coming in, it was coming in very late. And what that means is it was coming in very expensive, not because the test was necessarily expensive to run, but because affecting change was shockingly, shockingly expensive. And the reason we saw this kind of delta is that this is uh, pictures of when we first tested and when we last, last tested in Halo 4, the same level. We had very, very early versions of a thing we could test for gameplay. And we didn't really have anything for narrative because we were waiting for the cutscenes to come in. And there just wasn't anything in build early on. And yes, you can definitely ask teams to build animatics and things like that. That's super cool if you can talk them into it. But my goodness, that is a hard conversation. It is an expensive conversation to have. And we were looking for something that we could do across all of the many games that uh, we test. So we went and we said, well, what do we have in the very early part of prototype? And the answer is there is something that narrative designers have. They're the narrative beats. And we thought about that. And these are basically um, a list of the, the sort of a of events that are going to happen in the game from a narrative perspective, a couple of pages long, very, very early on in development. And this is so they can, in fact, make a plan, figure out what cutscenes they need to make, all of that kind of good stuff. And what's interesting about this is um, this maps very neatly onto a theoretical divide that narratology uses, which there is a difference between a story and its telling. And we were waiting for the telling to come in, and we thought, well, maybe we should just be testing the story and not worrying so much about the telling. And as it happens, this maps very neatly onto a divide that most researchers make anyway, which is there's a phase where you test usability style questions, right? Can people do something? Do they understand things? Um, can they just interact with the game the way that they're supposed to? And then later, when you have more of a build and you have something that's more um, sort of emotional, you get into this larger end play testing where you get into the feels, the questions about pace and challenge and fun and all of that kind of stuff. And so we saw a parallel here. And the question was, what do we use for stimuli? Um, and where with the telling, we could use the build, because that would be the cutscenes. Here, we were going to use a deck, and quite literally a PowerPoint, or in this case, I guess Google Slides deck. And so this workshop is on how you build that deck. Okay? And the reason we focused on that is because this is the point where you need to take what a designer's intent is and translate it into stimuli. And this is something where you must have the confidence to, to depend on your experience as a researcher, because you cannot typically just present what a designer is going to give you. In large part because designers, when they're building these narrative beats, are oftentimes building them essentially as a pitch for upper-level executives, or they are building them as a set of tools so they themselves can build a beautiful, rich narrative. They they aren't necessarily a good representation of what's going to be in the game. This is the point of greatest ambiguity, and it is the point when I am training people where I do the most hands-on work, and this is why we've opted to prioritize that. 
I will say, the other most common question I'm emailed is, how do you judge the severity of a problem? I don't think I'm going to have time to go through all of that, but the best I can do is put a slide up that gives you a description of all of our severity ratings and presume that you can go back and read this when you um, actually have findings and you're trying to sort of estimate this kind of thing. Today, what we're going to have you do, and we're going to have you do this in pairs, because this is about wrangling ambiguity, and so actually having to talk and explain like, why you're making decisions to another person is a very effective way to sort of facilitate that. Um, we're going to have you build a deck, or in this case, actually, probably one slide, maybe two if you're real fast, um, where we have you go through and think about the bullet points of text you would be presenting to people. Normally, we would build out a slide um, deck that goes from, from end to end on the story. We're going to give you materials that are akin to narrative beats. We are going to give you the sort of um, mock-ups. They're not real. Please, we're not making this game. Um, and we're going to give you mock-ups of what you would normally have in this, and we're going to ask you to practice building this stimuli. Okay? So think about the words, and think about what image you want to put on this, because this is the typical layout that we use. Um, and the picture is very good for sort of setting tone and providing people a thing to stare at when you're awkwardly asking them questions. It's very useful. Um, to explain how we're going to do this, I'm going to give you to Todd. Okay, so, uh, and we may actually need to go in more groups of more than two, given yeah, there the are a lot of people here. people here. So we're going to hand out uh, packets of information that are going to be very similar to what a designer or a narrative director might put together. Uh, Ironically enough, it will be more information than you actually need for the task, although very much a condensed down version of what your uh, narrative designers might actually give to you. Uh, the two main things you're going to receive, uh, aside from a couple of blank sheets of paper on which to build your slides, are a set of the narrative beats for roughly the first hour of the game, or the equivalent, and a couple of character summaries that will give you some information about uh, you know, who some of the key people are in the game. Oh, and we do have like the key game mechanics. Deborah, is that correct? Yeah, we have a couple of key game mechanics. Yeah, so there will be a list of a couple of the key game mechanics so that you have some sense of what people will actually be doing in the game. And as Deborah mentioned, uh, what we're going to task you to do is put together those couple of slides that will represent what is happening from a narrative standpoint uh, in this section of the game. And the goal is you're trying to produce a set of stimuli that will help you assess whether or not people are essentially grokking the story of the game. Are they getting what's going on? Are they running into points of confusion? Are the, is the story setting up good mysteries or is it setting up bad mysteries that people just don't have a chance of actually following? So how are you going to do this? Uh, so we've put up uh, these guidelines uh, and we'll leave this up during the course of the exercise. Uh, the first step is figure out what you think is important. As you're reading through all of this information, you have to decide on what are the key things that you need to focus on for the course of this test. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's way more information than you will actually be able to use and way more information than you actually need. So you're going to want to focus in on what are the things that you think it's important for people to actually understand. And use this to help develop your research questions as you're planning out uh, what you would be presenting to people. Second thing, you're going to want to describe what the players are seeing and hearing. Uh, remember, we're trying to emulate what the end experience is going to be for a player of this game. So uh, writing in the present tense is very helpful because you're kind of setting up this idea of this is the action as it's happening. Uh, you need to decide you know, what would players have seen at this point or what is information that is provided in the background so you have a better idea of the overall game world, but the player's not going to be introduced to yet. And that's an important distinction to make. Uh, Item number three, embellish bits if you need to. This is not going to be the full course of the story. At this point in development, the full course of the story probably hasn't been written yet. There are gaps that are in place. Some of those gaps you may need to assess from a research standpoint so that you understand, okay, the writer hasn't put, in some, put something in here yet. I need to then examine if that's going to be a problem for the player. Other little bits, like for example, the name of a side character, feel free to make up. You know, just put in whatever you have to to kind of create a coherent story. You'll be talking with your narrative designers. In this exercise, that'll be represented by us, but if you were actually doing this, you would be talking with your designers. You'd have the opportunity to ask the questions like, okay, what is important here? What's not important here? I just said this is the thing that's happening. Is that close enough to accurate for right now? And they'll either say, yes, that's fine, or they'll say, no, actually, this is going to happen, or, and this actually happens, they may say, oh, 
crud, I didn't think about that. I need to <laughs> figure out something out and put that in. Uh, next item. Uh, in terms of, we have given you uh, multiple slides to work with if you are able to get to that point. Obviously, if you were to do this for an actual title, you'd be working with multiple slides. You need to think about where you're going to put in the breaks. Um, some breaks will be perfectly natural. They'll come at the end of a particular scene or sequence, but other times you're going to need to pause in the middle of the action. And so you want to use this as an opportunity. Uh, one of the things you can do is think about what sort of predictions you are going to ask your study participants to make. Those predictions can be very informative in terms of telling you what are the key threads that they're focusing on, what are things that should be in the story but they've missed. You know, are you setting up good cliffhangers and good mysteries? Is that red herring that the narrative designer deliberately planted actually landing? Or are people wildly off base and expecting a completely different resolution to the story? And so by considering where you're going to put that pause in place, where you're going to have the transition from one slide to the next, that's giving you the moment to ask those questions and get that information. And then lastly, uh, treat us like the designers. So we're just going to be wandering around. Uh, you can feel free to ask us questions as you're working on this, uh, and we will try to act as uh, the narrative designers would when you would ask that question. In fact, I think Deborah's going to act as the designer. I will then try to do some translation into user research language uh, to help with this exercise. Uh, remember, in the end, this is a usability. It has some different forms of stimuli than maybe you're used to, uh, but if you've done paper, paper prototyping before, there's gonna be a lot of analogs. So you know, just treat it like that. You're thinking about things like, are there comprehension issues with what's going on? Are you running into uh, potential blockers uh, with progression? You know, are you dealing with issues of task failure? Task failure in this case being comprehension of the narrative. And so that should be kind of your guidelines there. Um, so is somewhat more popular than I was anticipating. So make friends with people and try to do this in as large a group as you can. We've done it with in groups of up to four. It can be done. Just talk it through and pass things around. You can also rip out all the staples and things like that. Do all be good people and solve this for me. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to give you as much time as we possibly can. At the end of this, we will walk through a solution to this. We're actually going to walk through two solutions of this, uh, looking at various granularities, and we'll open it back up to questions. So... Good luck, <laughs> raise your hand if you have questions, and otherwise, please help out your fellow, fellow URs. And yeah. I'm gonna start. All right. Uh, pencils down. <laughs> pencils down, everybody. Okay, so we are going to walk through um, two versions of how to do this slide. Uh, the reason we're gonna do two versions is one of the biggest questions, and a couple of you asked about this, is granularity. To what degree do you give all of the detail, and to what degree do you pull it up and give not so much detail? And the answer I'm going to give you is that depends, of course, because oftentimes you need a lot of granularity to establish characters, and then, or you go through and you say, well, I know this part of the story works, so I don't need a lot of granularity here, so I'm going to sort of level it up and speed through. This is a judgment call to make, and I'm going to show you a high granular version, and then um, Todd's going to show you a lower granular version. To be clear, when I do it in this high granular version, the um, chapter that I want that, that we gave you, the only bits that we gave you take about three slides to put through um, in this, okay? So the game opens with a shot of a crate. In the background, there's a low-pitched mechanical hum and thumps are coming from the crate. Many of you asked about a cold open. This is the right question to ask. So it is extremely typical for designers to have this whole back nonsense of story that they know and they understand that why doesn't everybody know this? And it's because we're not gonna tell people. And so we start with what we're actually gonna tell people. And we give a very physical description of what we're gonna show, right? You'll note, I made up the low-pitched mechanical hum. I would have normally asked a designer if that would have been a typical thing to do. That is the only thing that I'm gonna do to hint at the presence of a Zeppelin. Because where the character starts, they wouldn't be able to see that. They wouldn't be able to know that, okay? The camera shifts perspective, moving inside the crate, and the player is prompted to look up and open the crate. Afira Anoza, the player, climbs out and takes a candle out of her skirt pocket, lights it, revealing a small storage room. So I'm doing a couple of things here. A number of people asked about game mechanics and why we were sort of including those, quite frankly. Was it about game mechanics? Was it about narrative? Well, it's about narrative, but narrative is generally about justifying the use of game mechanics, and people know it's a game. So you tell them, oftentimes it's useful, to say, you the player, this you, 
right? That, that's the kind of thing they know. They also understand how to think about camera shift, and that's a perfectly reasonable cue to describe. You can describe these kind of game and mechanics if they're going to be useful to you, right? Afira says, where is it? Where is it? You should have left it in here. As she searches around the room, Afira finds a satchel with her bracer, widget gun, and goggles. Yes, reliable as ever, Gregory. What am I doing here? I'm putting back in all of that backstory. She's got a partner. I would expect people to know that. And I would put something in here like this because this is typically how narrative designers will do this. Maybe it'll be in the like, your partner has left you some stuff um, sort of way. Or maybe it'll be like, oh man, I need some ammo and I'm talking to myself again. Whatever the mechanic is, it doesn't matter. It's going to be something like this. It's not going to be subtle, right? Um, you also know, I just made up a name, Gregory. Part of why I did that is um, because one of the problems with this character, Afira Anoza, is that is a friggin' ridiculous name, right? She's supposed to be human. Nobody in this world is going to look at that name and think, ah, oh, that's not an elf, right? Like, it's, it's the kind of thing where when, when people bring in these kind of specialized, I want to make you unique kind of thing, they oftentimes mistake the kind of knowledge that people bring along with it. They, mis they forget the genre information because they are so fixated on sort of the specifics of the beauty of their story, right? Um, and that's actually one of the things that, that comes in a lot. The other thing I want to call out is just the term widget gun. I use the term widget a lot. When people don't know what the mechanic is, but there's definitely going to be a mechanic that's going to be like an object, you just say, they use a widget, and people are like, oh yeah, widget. And they're fine with that. Like, they don't need the detail on that. They know you're going to give them a thing, and then you're going to use the thing, and then that thing is going to unlock something. It's a form of key, whatever it is, they don't care, right? You can be pretty loosey-goosey about that. There's a large white apron and a small white cap. She puts them on over her black dress. I picked this image because Think about the world building it does. It is an incredibly strong visual cue, telling you more about the world that she's in. It also is worth talking about the game mechanics specialty, right? This is one of the things that are going to inevitably describe as a differentiator. Um, I'm going to, we're going to do stealth, but you're going to have to like, dress up as people. And like, yeah, it's kind of like Hitman 2, but like, it's ours is going to be special and magical, and nobody's ever going to have done it before, right? Like, that's the kind of thing that game design like narrative design needs to justify for game design to be allowed to do. And so this is one of the functions that narrative often provides. Um, it also, you will note, strongly constrains the imagination of people. One of the most valuable things that a picture does is it limits the things that your participants are going to add to this narrative, right? If you put them in a world, if you give them a reference, they think within those boundaries. Afira puts on her goggles and uses them to a find a glowing spot in the room. She uses the widget gun to draw power from the spot and open a hole in the wall. Thanks for that chaos. Now, where are the captain's quarters? Again, with a stupid talking to herself. But some way this information is going to be passed on because she's going to have a mission and the player's going to know what it is. We're also always starting with a physical description of what's going to be happening. Happening A glowing spot on the wall that you reveal through your goggles and then you somehow something, something gun and now you've got a gun full of it. Right? This is the level of granularity. You don't need, need to get into all of the numbers. You don't need to get into all the details. But particularly when you're doing a high granular sort of presentation, this kind of information is useful because it lets people know this is gameplay, this is narrative. One of the most common comments you'll get from people is, they better let me do that. Because if people come in and they, you describe something badass, and they're like, that better not be a cutscene. Because they know games do that, right? Um, and that's very disappointing. Here is the higher level version. So uh, starting at the top here, uh, this covers, I would say, like pretty much the entirety of the uh, handout that we gave you. Uh, you can see that we condensed uh, the previous slide into a bullet point and a half here. Um, in, in this first bullet point, we've got the cold open, we've got the introduction to the character and the fact that that character is the player, and we've got uh, searching the room and finding her equipment. So we've got the most important bits of you know, that intro scene, and we've just kind of shrunk everything else down. Uh, then we get into the second bullet point, we have the uh, costume mechanic that's introduced. We have the introduction of the widget gun, the chaos, all of that sort of stuff, and using this as a way to break through barriers. And here we're talking about the action of actually sneaking through the Zeppelin now. We've, you can see at this level how quickly we've progressed through a whole bunch of description that's been laid out. And we're doing it this way because 
you know, this would be an example of what you want to do when, say, you have 30 hours worth of story that you need to get through in roughly a 90-minute usability session, especially if you've already done a uh, usability where you've gone in-depth on uh, this early part of the game. You can start speeding through this, and now you're just thinking about, okay, what information do I need to pass to the participant to kind of get them along and still accurately represent what's going to happen in the story? So we another key beat that we have in here is... Uh, silently taking out a guard because this is important because one it's you know describing some of the combat that's going to happen in the game and it's going to set up everything that happens uh elsewhere in the game like without the guard being taken out there is no you know issue of Afira being discovered and you know a whole combat scene uh ensuing um so we jump to the next bullet point. Uh, Afira finds an ornate door, picks the lock, entering the large office. Uh, this one sentence here, she ignores several valuables. Uh, that's an important thing to bring up about the character's backstory, about her motivations, and about her identity. Uh, up to this point, like she's breaking and entering. So, but now she's ignoring some stuff that she could profitably steal. Why is that happening? This is probably something you're going to want to ask the participants, participants about. Do they pick up on it? What do they think of it? Um, also, you'll notice that we've can, we're not doing nearly as much dialogue as we did in the uh, previous slide. That's just because we don't have as much room. But then you have these little key bits that kind of naturally explain you know, what's going on. Like Deborah mentioned, slipping in that backstory so that people have the context. Uh, next bullet point, an alarm is raised, guards rush in. This is like a whole 10 minute combat sequence. We've just you know, condensed it down to a single uh, sentence. Um, then we have, uh, the introduction of the tall, cloaked figure with glowing eyes. Notice we don't say vampire. You know, there, there's not going to be a flashing neon sign that says this is a vampire, but what you can do is take certain you know, expected physical descriptors and pass those along to whoever's reading to, and then assess whether or not they get the point. That can become an open research question. It's like, are, are people picking up on this bit of information? And then what do they expect because of it? Um, then uh, glowing eyes comes in, the view of the scene blurs for the player, making combat impossible. We never actually say hypnotize. You know, uh, if you think about how this is going to be presented in gameplay, uh, there's not going to be an omniscient narrator coming in to say that the vampire hypnotizes Ephira. So we've got to think about how that's going to come across to a player. You know, this may or may not actually be what happens, and your narrative designer may give you some feedback on that, or they may just say, go with it for now, because they're going to figure it out later. Uh, then you have guard comes in, uh, traps with a net gun, dangles her out the window, interrogating her. And at this point, the Zeppelin has come in. And that's why we've gone with uh, the Zeppelin here uh, as one of the images on the slide. Uh, you'll notice that uh, we didn't bring that up before because there was really no context for it. But on this slide, you are actually getting the context that this is happening in a Zeppelin that's flying through the air. So you have that picture in there. there uh, you, at this point, you don't need to withhold that information to get something useful from the participant. Uh, a fear refuses to talk, and the guard drops her out the window. Also, good uh, point to actually put in an image of a fear so that people have some sense in their head of what the main character looks like. Uh, and then you have the Afira falling for a moment, her mechanical wings open, she glides down to a soft landing. We've done a couple things here. One, we've set up that she has this whole glider mechanic on her back, uh, at which point uh, the participant may say, how did anyone not notice that? Uh, <laughs> which is gonna be kind of a key question. But also, uh, even though this has gone through like 95% of the information that was in the packet, I've stopped before I actually get to the reveal that this guard is Gregory the sidekick. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One, this is, like we said before, think about where the breaks can be useful and you can get some interesting predictions out of this. Uh, this is not a mystery that's necessarily going to be maintained for very long, but by stopping here, it gives you a, a moment to assess what people are getting out of the story and you know, what they think is going to happen with this character. Um, the other thing is the reveal of Gregory, the guard as a confederate, that's just going to take so much information to explain, even in this condensed form, better to just cut it off right here and give yourself a new slide to work with so that you're not, you know, 
trying to cram in three lines of text into this last space in this you know, one slide that honestly is probably a bullet point longer than you would normally want to go anyway. All right, so that is two versions of that. And after this, we're just gonna open up for questions because I don't know what you actually wanna know. And here's the mic. Hello. Hello, one, two. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, have you ever tried using Storyboard? Because I, I, uh, I cannot not compare to what, uh, what we do. By the way, I'm, I'm working for Ubisoft Quebec. Mm -hmm. uh, when we do tests on UR narrative, you usually go with a lot of storyboarding that actually reduce even more the number of words the needs to read. And the visual strikes sometimes a lot more, the imagination and uh, can allow the player to go faster through storyboards. Have you ever tried that? Yes, we've tried storyboards. I have two reactions to storyboards. Um, one is they're terrible and the other is they're great. It sort of depends on how you use them. Um, so I have had uh, teams present me with essentially the concepts of the story that they've done up like comics and they're like amazing and they look so good. And people draw all sorts of wackadoodle conclusions and are not in fact accurate representations of the narrative itself. This is one of the problems with storyboards. If what you have are the kind of storyboards that animators make when they're kind of like, I got a s oval for a face not looking at stuff and then there's a gun and there's like that kind of thing those work a lot better like that kind of sketched out where there where it really is about the accuracy of the representation and those to be perfectly honest when i have those as cutscenes i'll just play them there's no reason for me not to the problem is that i rarely have a team particularly if i am pushing smaller teams because remember i work across publishing right i, I oversee all of global pub um, which means I work across a lot of teams, and not everybody has the budget to do that, right? That's the kind of thing where if you're on your third iteration of a successful franchise, you may well have that money, but if you're not, you probably won't. So the answer is I integrate them where I think they're accurate, um, and then I don't use them, and I specifically avoid them when I think that they are about inspiration um, and trying to get people to like something rather than actually accurately presenting information. Uh, where I have also uh, run into some good use for them is once you actually do get to the playtest stage where you've got a lot of the game that's actually playable, but there's a lot of the rendering that hasn't been done. You insert those in there and people are able to follow the story and they're able to give you good feedback on you know, not only what they understand, but how they're reacting to characters and key story beats, even with something as minimally sketched out as that. And to be clear, it can be inje interjected in the survey rather than in the build itself, because yep. you can like yep. that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of curious about um, this document that you gave mm -hmm. us. This kind of represents like what I guess a designer or writer might deliver, it's and then it's, yeah, it's it is a more detailed. It is it, if you have somebody who's into documentation, this is a pretty typical thing. Sometimes they're going to be a little higher level, but this along with the characters, along with the, like a GDD and things like that is what I would expect to have at this point, yeah. Okay, and then I guess what was written up on the screen here is what a user uh, researcher would write? Typically in combination with a narrative designer. So um, it, this is part of the onboarding process to get them to buy in on this. You want them mm -hmm. signed off on the deck before you run it with anything. They have to agree that it's a fair representation of the narrative, that kind of thing. Also, I kind of love working with narrative designers because of all the designers, they are the most literate. Really nice if you're writing up reports. Um, also very okay with like just reading stuff. They're amazing copy editors for the record. Like they're really spectacular to work with. Um, but yeah, this is the kind of thing where oftentimes I'll take first whack at it and then send it back to somebody and I'll highlight, I'll just highlight all the weird stuff that I've added being like, I don't know how you're actually going to do this. Can you correct this um, if this isn't representative and things like that? Okay. I'll, oh, and I was just going to jump in to say I've actually had uh, experience kind of working in the other direction where I've shown my partners examples of what a narrative deck might look like and they've actually been able to put it together and then sent it to me and then I would kind of do the editing pass of let's move this around here. Let's fill this out. Let's spread this out a little bit more. It just kind of depends on you know, where things are in development and like what your partner has time to work on. Okay, uh, that's great. I, mean, I guess I'm just, because I was curious because in this uh, write-up, it mentions the Zeppelin early and then in your bullet point, you reveal the Zeppelin at the end. So that's, that's like a big creative decision. It's right? not a creative decision because if you look at what, what the way that they present it, they, t they give you the story the way they explain it to somebody that they're pitching it. This is very typical, by the way. And then they say, and then we start with a cold open, right? And so your, your question, the thing that you're looking for is what is the first thing that's going to be presented to somebody, mm. right? Because the way that you explain a narrative to somebody who's up your management chain to approve it so they're going to give you all the funding is very different from how you model it as, as an actual experience. And what you need to index on is how you model it as an actual experience. And if you remember, like, there was uh, in the 
lengthened version of the slide that we showed, there was that kind of sensory information that came through. That's the sort of detail that we might infer and kind of write in and then run it past the designer and say, okay, we think it might look like this. Are we going to be able to expect that this will happen? Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. We're oh. out of time, but I'll keep asking, answering questions. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, no happy, time. Uh, we'll be out in the hall there, I guess, yeah, if I people want to come by and ask us stuff. Thanks, all. <laughs>